Hey everyone, today I have Layman Pascal with me uh, to continue some ongoing conversations. I know that uh, uh, Nietzsche is a is sort of in the air from recent conversations with uh, Dark Renaissance folks, and and uh, I'd love to get Layman's take on uh, I guess what you could call sort of the the integral Nietzsche. Um, but that would be one topic, and then of course there's just so much around um, Dark Renaissance topics. I guess what I'd love to explore a little bit is sort of um, the dark side, maybe would be a, a way of framing this a little bit. So uh, I, uh, I deeply appreciate your your insight and your perspective. So thank you. Yeah, great to be here, Brendan. Um, I like you. These are always good conversations. I think you're, you know, orbiting the center of all this stuff. Thank you. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. Let's just dive in. I guess um, we could just make a hard pivot to to Nietzsche and and, uh, and 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 you know integral theory and stuff like that. Whichever whichever you'd like. Yeah, to. let's do that because the interview you gave I thought was one of. I've spent a lot of time thinking about Nietzsche and Wagner and their relationship, and mm -hmm. so what you did was one of the best. I know you've done work on this in the past, but um, that conversation brought forth you know one of the richest analyses of that that i've heard so i really like that and got me excited oh, about this you. stuff and i've often pointed to nietzsche as a proto-integralist and as zarathustra being the you know the first western post-metaphysical spiritual hero um the how as opposed to the what that's a really interesting thing to consider in nietzsche because very often we go look nietzsche made this elaborate philosophy but look at these parts was he really um archaic regressive atavistic pre-trans barbaric fetishist you go well how was he saying you know did he just talk about a blonde beast or how did he talk about the blonde beast what's the indicator here what was the sentence structure and the tempo where did it all fit in like how are we going to diagnose this guy and i think he's in a special character in which style is as important as content in what he's trying to bring forward. And in fact, is part of the message he's trying to bring forward. I, I see his, um, his life as a kind of journey where he's asking himself a question. And on the other side of the thus spake Zarathustra revelations, which are legitimately spiritual and in many respects are a meta narrative. On the other side of that, what he's got is a redemptive mood. And he keeps talking about it's golden and it's overflowing and it transfigures the world. And it goes like this, all the sentences in the genealogy of morals and beyond good and evil and Ecce Homo, they're, they're dripping with something. He's trying to show in the, in the style just as much as he is in the content. And that's because he's a musician or he was a composer of music, a lover of music. And when we think about, you know, well, whoa, whoa, look, there's barbaric elements creeping into Nietzsche. I'm like, well, sure, but you're going to play all the notes on the scale, aren't you? <laughs> well, oh, yeah. Okay, so let's dive into that then, because um, I think it's, yes, I, I agree with so much of that. Um, and I think it would be wrong to just paint Nietzsche as some sort of pure atavistic reactionary who just, you know, wants to go back to some heroic noble age or something, right? It, it, he's too nuanced, he's too subtle, he's too refined. Um, so all that's true. Uh, I guess the question then becomes, how do we properly parse the how from the what of what he's saying? How do we interpret the seeming, if not contradictions, then at least tensions between this sort of you know, uh, what in some ways seems to be suggesting a lament of, you know, the modern age and this sort of desire to go back uh, to, to the Homeric period of grandeur and chaos and glory and everything with, with his, uh, his, his romantic, subtle, uh, yeah, sort of um, sensibility. How, how, do, how do we figure, that, figure, out, figure out what that's about? Yeah, and it, I mean, the approach is different depending on what your goal is, right? If you want to be a scholar, then you have to try to take an objective overview and try to make some kind of correspondence between that and what you think the general discourse on the subject is. Uh, that's not my personal interest, right? The, the Nietzsche that I'm looking for is the one who's going to best reflect me, <laughs> the part of myself that I see in the tea leaves, of Nietzsche's writing, and that can best exemplify the emergent trends of the, the greater liminal thing that we see emerging forward. So that's what I'm specifically looking for something. So I'm not an unbiased interpreter. 
But what I see is a real need to understand the approach to communication that he's using and the approach to knowledge formation that he's using. And his approach to knowledge formation is profound, but there are areas in his life, obviously, we typically point to emotional, sexual, and those sorts of things. He didn't have great interpersonal relationships. He didn't have a rich home life. He it was very stunted or not supported in some ways. So we expect him to be lower on those areas and to have a wobble or a bump in his overall processing, as we all do in some areas. And what we are hoping for is someone who's exemplifying the ability to fold in even their weak areas, to make their weak areas and strong areas come together in an artistic integration that shows the potential of integration to create more than the sum of its parts. And I think he does that very well. But we can still point to the areas in which he's weak, uh, in which we don't, right? My, I'm hoping my relationship with my therapist isn't going to leave me like him relative to relationships, so to speak. Uh, nonetheless, we can admire the way he folds in even his lack, which is is part of this Hegelian, Lacanian, Zizekian, you know, kind of thing. How do you how do you not necessarily valorize, but legitimize and really respect and try to integrate your lack as a lack? And the other part is his communication style is poorly understood. Right, he's very clear that he's not writing for a general audience, not even a general academic audience. He's writing for a very specific group of people. And I think he's laying landmines in his phrasing to drive off the wrong people, right? If there's a way to say something that will be polarizing and provocative, he'll tend to say it that way. And in partly that's an act of integrity because he's gonna go down to that part of his developmental scale and say, here's how it looks from down here. Uh, but he's gonna, he's doing that on purpose also to trigger people. Because if you're going to hear that with a conventional social associative triggering, you're not the reader he's looking for. He's looking for a reader who has what he calls the third ear, right? Somebody who hears that there's a structure underneath the associative affect, somebody who can clean the words coming in. If he uses a dismissive pejorative term, you have to clean that first and then hear the idea. If you buy into the phrasing, then you go down a path and you're exited from understanding what he's trying to say, which he wants. He would rather mislead the wrong people than communicate to them. There's a very specific target audience here. And I think understanding that helps us to make that distinction you were talking about. That's very interesting. And in that sense, it, 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 there's a lot of overlap between, you know, the other great, in my mind, existentialist prophet philosopher Kierkegaard and the way that the, the, the means of communication, well, I guess you could say, you know, the, 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 the medium is the message in some ways, or, or that, that, the, that the medium is so tied up with what the message is that they are just completely inseparable. Um, what you were just saying, though, about sort of folding in your, your own uh, weaknesses, the, one, of my, one of the many quotes that I really love of his is he writes, um, I think this is from Human All to Human, he says, however you may be, be your own source of experience. Throw off your discontent about your nature. Forgive yourself your own self. You have it in your power to merge everything you have lived through, false starts, errors, delusions, passions, your loves and your hopes into your goal with nothing left over. And uh, I love the idea of, of, of that, of being able to turn everything into something that you would will, I guess, um, and uh, to will maybe even your own lapses and lacunae. Um, but I think it also does raise, you know, this doesn't make him immune to a certain kind of critique, which is, well, what are those lapses? And do they hobble him in such a way that make his philosophy problematic uh, to a degree that we should really take seriously? Um, you know, even if you're able to, to clean what comes in, is there something about what he's saying that after that process still uh, might be leading you ultimately down a path that isn't the most salutary? Um, sure. And of course, it's interesting. it's interesting to me that we ask that question in this case, right? Mm. Because that's a question applicable to every thinker. Sure. And we're asking it in the case of the thinker who particularly attempted to fold those things in. 
<laughs> so in a way you would guess that he might be less susceptible to that factor than any of the other thinkers who didn't even think to try to do something like that. Now, it doesn't make it invalid in his case, but it's interesting that we collectively ask that question about him and not of Hegel. <laughs> sure. No, I mean, arguably that's a, a symptom of his own success, right? He made us start asking those questions because he, you know, for him, philosophy is biography, right? You, you, can't, you can't separate the two because um, it is a matter of, of where you're coming from and your perspective. And, you know, the, the genius of sort of, you know, he would always say that he was a psychologist in some ways, first and foremost, right? And that what he was doing was psychologizing philosophy and psychologizing philosophers, right? You know, when you look at, a, at, at Kant's philosophy, don't just take it on its own terms. What does Kant want? You know, what, what do you want by finding Kant's philosophy attractive? And those sorts of questions, which, um, yeah, I mean, of course, many people have said that, uh, you know, you wouldn't have a Freud without Nietzsche, right? Um, that the whole notion of, of the unconscious and, and all these sorts of things comes from this, this, you know, way of thinking that Nietzsche starts to really uh, articulate and, and make clear. So it, in some ways, it's sort of we ask these questions of him because he's the one who puts these questions on the table to begin with. Um, you know, if anything, we're just not taking them far enough. Um, but still, to ask the question, right? Uh, one of the things I wanted to get your take on was this sort of thought that I had that, um, right, you know, uh, I've been really interested by this sort of idea of transition from meta memes, right? And you can look at, um, to use sort of Hansian terms, right? If you have the, the, the sort of Faustian age or in spiral dynamics, the red, you know, imperialistic kind of Homeric uh, self, and that meta meme associated with all that. And then you get the axial age where that transitions to this post Faustian or blue uh, code where it's, it's not about shame and honor. It's about guilt. Um, there's so much I feel like that is really open to be sort of explored as a mapping between that model and what Nietzsche is talking about in his genealogy of morals from, you know, the transition. And he doesn't, of course, use any of the language of meta memes or axial age or any of that. He just sees this basically as this shift from the heroic and the noble to the, uh, to the, to the moralistic and the, and the kind of the consumption with, with guilt and the ways then, I mean, he takes it a whole step further and how that get, actually gets co-opted, you know, uh, uh, by people who want power in the old in the old way, but um, I was intrigued because I think that his work in that you know maps the same progression. He has his own philosophical take on it, and yet when I read him, unless I'm just falling down a rabbit hole that he set up for me and I'm not properly cleaning you know what's coming in, I do read him as saying that there's something really profoundly uh you know uh downhill <laughs> the progression that occurred uh from the noble uh self-affirming you know um hero of let's just say the greek past compared to the you know uh the the slithering priestly uh you know figure of the medieval period or something like that that then becomes sort of a modern european man right and and i can't help but read him as saying man, wow, that's really unfortunate. Like we need to regain something of that older form. And then the question is like, to what degree is that a reactionary move, right? Is he just making this, uh, uh, you know, comparison that then he says, well, we should go back to red or, or anyway. So yeah, I think you get the basic uh, idea there. Sure. Yeah. And there's a, uh, I mean, first of all, you know, when we read his critiques of the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music, I mean, he's essentially saying I was conflating I was making a pre-trans fallacy there. As much as the ideas are good, there's a mood there that is retro-romantic and atavistic. And that's why he, it's his least favorite of his books. Hmm. Not that there isn't brilliance in there, but he spends some time trying to cure himself, right? He has to get up to the human, all too human phase of his life, make sure that he's a scientific, <laughs> clear thinking humanist guy mm -hmm. so that he can legitimately go beyond that. So he's self-diagnosing some of the things you're talking about. But then there's this question of developmental history and health versus sickness. And they both have a certain pre-trans quality to them. And I think we need to understand Nietzsche as 
having a complex view of what's working and not working at each of the different moments of the historical narrative that he's laying out, right? Our, our friend Bard will talk about the difference in the Dionysian swarm and the Sibylline mob, right? And part of that is saying, look, if you have a collaborative group intelligence at any stage in history, sometimes that's going to be regressive and degenerate, and it's going to be turning its, it's going to be seizing mythos from its pathos in a way that's basically superstitious and murderous and stupid. And the mob is less than the individual. But other times, the, the, the collaborative intelligence is greater than that of the individual. And that's a thing that's true at every stage of history, right? What's healthier and what's less healthy? And Nietzsche is bringing forward health and even what he calls the great health, which is something like enlightenment, as a split down the middle of history. So it's important, I think, not to read him just in terms of historical stages, but in terms of a split within all historical stages. Well, OK, so that, that's that's interesting, because I, as you mentioned, the, I, I've wondered if this plagues even his Dionysian conception. Right. Um, of course, famously, right. He articulates this in the birth of tragedy, but it goes all the way to the end. The 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 valorization, uh, the valorizing of the Dionysian impulse, um, which, you know, in the in in the kind of initial formulation, the the Apollonian, by contrast, is sort of the the, the clean and the pure and the the sort of nice dainty form that that you know basically is then an illusory veil that covers the Dionysian, which is the dark and the crazy and chaotic and, 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 and uh, where individualization sort of disappears and you just get the, the kind of, yeah, wildness. Um, but then you also, of course, get inspiration and music, of course, and all these other, you know, romantic sensibilities, right? I guess the question is like, to the degree that this pre-trans fallacy is going on, and this came up with my conversation with uh, Owen Cox and, and Daniel uh, Fraga is sort of like, are we making a, a, a false assumption that what is at the core or at the root rather is somehow fun, uh, uh, somehow um, the essence of the thing, right? It's almost a naturalistic fallacy where something came from is what it ultimately is, right? And I think that there's a, a clear refutation of that in developmental thinking, which is like, no, the naturalistic fallacy isn't true. I'm not ultimately a reptile because I have a reptilian brain, right? I am, I'm based on a reptilian brain in some way, but I've also got a limbic system and a cortex and all that, right? And so if I just say, oh, my cortex is just the veneer of abstract thought on my true reptilian brain, I'm making a mistake in how I essentialize what I am. And this is a critique that I see cropping up a little bit in some of these psychoanalytic dark Renaissance circles. And I could argue that it's in Nietzsche too, of sort of saying like, oh, beneath the Apollonian veneer of everything is the, is the Dionysian chaos. And that that, because it's lower, is somehow truer. And I feel like if you add a developmental lens to the mix, that becomes problematized. And so, yeah, do you think that, I mean, because the way that you're talking about it is sort of like the Dionysian is, is the beyond. It's somehow... It's somehow tra some, something transcendent that we aspire to, which is in some ways what he's doing in The Birth of Tragedy. He's sort of inverting the whole plat neoplatonic, you know, one and making, making that actually the one is not simple and ordered. It's like, multi it's, well, it is still one, but it's chaotic and, and undifferentiated. It's that kind of classic, right, you know, retro romantic move of like everything was primordial and pure and good before we differentiated and the many came about that sort of a thing. So anyway, you know what I'm saying? Like, are you? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, uh, the critique that the primal conditions are not what condition the experiences we have now is extremely Nietzschean, right? You might even say he introduces that, that his most, his post metaphysics is in many respects, a critique of the idea of the continuity of qualities. And he says somewhere in the notebooks that the only thing you know for sure about the eye is that it didn't evolve for seeing, right? That you know, he, and he talks a lot about how love evolves as a spiritual refinement of the reproductive urge and what would happen if we did that same thing to cruelty to every other animal quality mm. right that the things we have now that are good are often retroactively projected back to a primal character 
to the goodness of God, to the goodness of the original situation. And he's very explicitly critiquing that move. So, I mean, of course, he's not immune from making it, but he's almost the first to be adding that critique. Um, <laughs> that was a silent. Take me back to the question you just asked that I said, of course. I <laughs> yeah. So is there a potential sort of, um, is he making the retro romantic error? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think this is where we have to take very seriously his self-critique of Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music. He's saying, you know, I was making that error. I wasn't adequately teasing those apart. And if we look at what Dionysus means in Beyond Good and Evil, compared to what it means in The Birth of Tragedy, it's quite different. And even in The Birth of Tragedy, he's not saying that the Dionysian is more primordial. He's saying there are two solutions to the contingent mortal nature of the universe. One is art. One is stylizing into the Apollonian dream, making it into a better scene. The other is the Dionysian relinquishing your own separate of pressure to get back in touch with the underlying energies. And that those are both important strategies and that the greatness of the pre-Socratic Greek culture, like the greatness of the Renaissance, was that it was able to bring both of those together. And that's what gives cultural regeneration. So he's making that argument from the very beginning. But if you trace out Dionysius over the course of things, he's at the end calling it the philosopher Dionysus, right? He's making it much more a character of Logos. In much, it's the god of the philosophers, but it's a seducer, tempter, protean, transformative, ecological, you know, yeah. god. So then, right? yeah. yeah, so then... Maybe this will help me gain greater appreciation for some of these dark Renaissance directions, which again, also, again, I mean, I, after some of these conversations, I, I do have a very deep appreciation for wanting to focus on these sorts of things. But I'm intrigued, too, because if, if the notion, though, that is potentially there is not just we need to kind of be aware of and get in touch with our deep, you know, chthonic urges and impulses and, and that sort of a thing. If it's not just saying that, if it's actually saying we should transfigure them in the way that you're talking about to this sort of this sort of Dionysian beyond, which isn't to say a, a beyond that's transcendent and immaterial and that sort of thing, but that it's somehow, yeah, it's still self-transcended. It's still, you know, what, what does it look like to transfigure cruelty and aggression into something that's not just base, right? What, what, is, what does transcendent aggression and cruelty look like? Yeah, if you look at, I mean, there's a great question for all of us to confront, which is to what degree is Wilbur uh, Nietzschean, right? And so one of the definitions of spirituality that Wilbur gives is the highest stages of any line. And that's the one much closer to what Nietzsche is saying, right? And we would maybe diversify the nature of lines into something closer to instincts if we were thinking about Nietzsche. But we take any of these things and refine it then it's going to become more and more hopefully convergent or convergent divergent, but at least uh, transfigured and radiant and more coherent and more nuanced and more infused with the vitality that we associate with empowerment. Right. And now how do you do that? How do you, you can't move on a line where you're not willing to accept the parts of yourself that are low on that line. Right. And he's not always great at this. He points out the, inability of us to appreciate the death of God. All right. And therefore you need to, in some ways, grieve the death of God, just like we collectively today need to appreciate the doom and apocalypse we're already in. But he doesn't do that very well. He doesn't really emotionally sink into the grieving of the death of God that would lead us toward the new divinity. He quickly bypasses that into more cognitive and aesthetic forms. But nonetheless, that general move of uh, accepting the roots, accepting the muck to build the tree is essential. In order to go down the refinement path of any of these lines, you have to start uh, at its base, as low as it is. And I think that's one of the arguments that's coming forth from the artistic and psychoanalytic communities of dark Renaissance, hell meta modernism. Think people are, who are themselves pretty conversant in some of the techniques for doing that. Yeah. Um, 
and by the way, I watched uh, and really enjoyed your conversation with uh, with Bruce and 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 John Verveke, where you explore some of the 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 things you were just talking about, like you know, the grieving of the death of God and all of that. Um, I really enjoyed that uh, rethinking of religion. I think it was the second rethinking of religion video. Um, but um, so here's a question then, because I think I've I've heard you say or into or imply something like this in other context. How would you relate? Um, the, you know, Nietzsche's sort of will to power idea to what is what you could think of as sort of Whitehead's creativity or what Wilbur kind of thinks about as Eros, you know, in, in action or spirit in action. Um, is that a is that an identification that you find a meaningful one? There's there's parts of it I do and parts of it that might not apply. Right. Wilbur and Whitehead pay a lot of attention to novelty in that emergence. Nietzsche does not pay very much attention to that. But nonetheless, there's a way of reading the will to power that is essentially the same as a trajectory of value increase over time, right? And this is one of the things because Nietzsche is like a musician. He's playing in these different keys. He's climbing all over the mountain. You got to go with him and, and he's trying to throw off the wrong people. And so it's up to the reader, not only to clean the words as they come in, but also to try to remember what the big picture is here, because he's holding the big picture back. We know from the notebooks, he has a big picture, but he doesn't publish the notebooks. Instead, he writes an antichrist pamphlet or something like that. Right? He thinks that's a better communication than telling you his system. But there's a system there, right? And it's important for all of us, I think, to, if we want to understand Nietzsche, tell ourselves his big picture story when we look at the parts of his writings. And his big picture story starts with um, energy and its subjective correlate, right? Will this desire for empowerment, the desire to integrate, to assemble and integrate and discharge in a way that causes becoming to feel like it's being, to feel the enhancement of power in an inherent self-overcoming move in, in units of flux that do this. That's where he starts. And these units do this and they collide with each other and they hold each other in check. And when they couple, it happens even more. The enhancement of the will to power experience, the feeling of empowerment and being is increased. And so they do that more. And that builds up in layers of increasing complexity, which is the history of the universe. And it's a very integral kind of story. Mm -hmm. And it gets, and the problem is the more complex you get, the more parts you have that can be integrated and therefore the power enhancement feeling of the being of your discharge is greater, but the possibility of something going wrong is also greater. And when you get up to the human in Nietzsche's story, you're facing a situation in which there is frequent disintegration of the instincts, but also the power of the greatest possible harmonization of the forces that we know so far. Yeah, I guess put that way, it sounds like there's a lot of overlap. <laughs> yeah, I, I would go further. I didn't want to just like, I could probably oh, no. talk for 10 minutes and just oh, keep going. tell his story. No, I love it. <laughs> keep going. Okay, well, he's, so you got the humans now, right? The human animal. And the human animal is ferocious and sensitive and all these different things. It tends to organize itself through some very predatory and murderous actions encoded in their minds as superstitions. But it's so easy for that complexity to go wrong, to be circumstantially traumatized, to be malnourished, to collide with each other and end up in trauma, that you end up with a huge spectrum of some really integrated human animals and some not as integrated human animals. And predation allows the more integrated ones to more successfully dominate the other ones. Uh, and this, it also allows... Um, uh, uh, some sort of pathological underminings within apparently dominant cultures. Anyway, this relationship between the more integrated and less integrated instinct sets creates dominator cultures of various kinds within particular cultures and between particular cultures. And when you dominate another culture or some people within your own culture, their attempt to reintegrate their instincts can only come at the expense of the established social order. 
And therefore you get the slave revolt in morals, right? Which is that these, anybody who's been put down by a system because their instincts or their ancestors' instincts were not capable of escaping that situation has got to revalidate themselves in a way that gives themselves new capacities and devalues the oppressors. And periodically this is going to totally work. Right. And that's a beautiful thing. Nietzsche loves the Jews, hates the Germans, loves the Jews most of the time. But the problem is when you do that move that we associate symbolically with the Jewish revolt, you end up with a new culture whose hierarchy is based on a mixture of the valid values of the people who were enslaved and the disregarded values of the enslavers. And which included among them some organic, actual healthy values. So some things that cause, some of the virtues that cause integration that were associated with the masters are now demonized. So now you have a social order that deliberately disregards or marginalizes some of the things we need in order to integrate ourselves. We have this mixed culture moving forward from that point, and it will go in one of two directions, right? It can lean into the priest's or people who have a strong sense of power within that system. And what they decide to do instinctively is tell other people virtues that actually make them weaker and tell them values that actually separate them from value. And that puts the priest in a better position over those people. Conversely, there's periodically moments of healing. There's the Dionysian cults. There's the Renaissance. There's the, uh, you know, gay science, cavalier, poet, artist, warriors that he likes so much. There are moments when this is getting healed and there are places where this is coming apart. And so all of the mixed history following the emergence of the dominator cultures uh, is this mixed system. And in Europe, we end up with this Judeo-Roman Platonic populism, which encodes and enshrines a lot of these negative value systems where we're saying to each other, the most valuable things are the things that actually separate you from value. And the supreme values are actually things that are impossible and that you can never access. That's definitely going to undermine itself over time. You can't chew up the tree can't chew its own roots off and survive for too long. So you get a, a downward arc within one region of the world at that time. Now, maybe it's in other regions, but he's looking at this one. Problem is that one's producing new modern technology. And so as we get the new technology, we're not in a healthy enough position to be able to integrate that and subordinate that to our actual organic multidimensional empowerment needs. So modernity just grinds us under its wheel because we weren't ready to handle it. And post-modernity starts to already emerge. He's seeing this new egalitarian progressive socialism coming up. And he's saying, look, you guys are replicating a lot of the same errors. This is just you and the scientists are coasting on this same nonsense. And we've got to critique our values see which ones are hollow and which ones aren't, right? We're going to philosophize with a hammer. If it smashes open hollow, get rid of it. If it stays solid, great. It's one of the good ones. We've got to figure out which ones work, which ones make us healthier. How do we move this forward? How do we get to the place on the other side of the nihilism that's become inevitable from this idealism? And that's going to require two kinds of philosophers. And the philosophers are among the people he thinks are the most exemplifying of the will to power. Right. The, one of the problems in Nietzsche analysis is we don't agree on what we mean by power. We don't think what Nietzsche thought by power. Right. In Nietzsche's mind, a poet is up here and a, you know, a dictator is down here when it comes to power. So we need to get these special kinds of philosophers. And some of them are these commanding visionary philosophers who are going to try to implement a new value system that they've come up with and use it for breeding a better humanity. And the other ones are these artistic experimental attempters who he sees coming over the horizon. And that these people are the ones who are going to be able to do two things, enter back into the service of the Dionysian spirit and also set the ultra human as the telos of their action in an embodied participatory organic universe where we're going to fall back, come back to the earth, come back to the body, but also pursue the ultra human. So that's what he sees as the possibility going forward. And what that is, is still very much an integral story where at each of these steps, the potential for value, which is the marker and the reflection of the enhancement of empowerment or the ability of the becoming 
complexities to establish themselves in their beingness. Um, that's going forward. That's the goal. That's the drift. All of the impulses want not power, but more power. And the coherence of more power is what we call value. So this is a story of the increase of value over time and of a conceptualization of how we could get there on the other side of the meaning crisis, essentially. Love it. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Um, but here's where I, I want to ask you a question too, though, because I feel like um, at the risk of opening myself to an easy critique from our dark Renaissance friends. Um, there's a way in which I see the focus and fascination with domination as mm -hmm. being problematic, right? Um, so, and I see, I, I see it a lot in Nietzsche and, and even in the story that you were kind of telling, right? It's sort of that, the, the how we conceive of power is I think, yes, it's the crucial thing that needs to be clarified. Because is power just, oh, I, I have the ability to express myself. I have the ability to be who I want to be, even as that is within a matrix of, you know, interpersonal connection and, you know, like, right. Because, okay, the difference between someone who can just, oh, I can be what I want to be. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to go beat up the mailman, you know, just because I feel like it, you know. Who, who, who are you to say different, you know, like that's a form of power, I guess. Um, and provided that there's no power that's more powerful to stop me, I can be a nice little petty tyrant. Right. Um, but then there's another power that's like, I, my goals and aspirations are to be a certain kind of person. And those include not beating up the mailman. Maybe I want to hear what the mailman has to say. Maybe the mailman's not such a bad guy or maybe whatever. Like there's a, there, there are certain responsibilities to my fellow man that I take into consideration, right? And there are certain people, they're sort of almost kind of libertarian bent that kind of look at, oh, any kind of imposition on what you want to do is now rendering you less powerful, um, which is to say basically conflating power with domination. It's like, what is power? Power is is exercising your ability to make another person or thing subservient to you uh, basically in every condition. Um, and for me, I feel like value is certainly tied to power, but I don't think that the more petty tyrants out there, the more beat up male per people in the world is an increase in value, right? So being able to parse what power is and what the growth of power really means and being able to articulate that in a way that isn't just uh, basically a, a, a limitation of someone's power or will to power in the way that I think the guilt systems are of like these blue moralistic traditional codes, right? Of saying, no, thou shalt not do that. We all know you want to go beat up the mailman, but a higher power says that you can't and shouldn't. And so, okay, now my power is constrained and now I internalize that and all this sort of thing, right? But like in my view of the world, like a healthy human being doesn't want to beat up the mailman. And I don't think that that is a limitation or, you know, and, and, and this is sort of, I'm not sure if you're, if I'm doing a good job of articulating what I'm seeing some of the, the contours of this debate here, but I see a lot of conflation of if I'm not able to go beat up the mailman, then I'm domesticated and I'm weak and I'm effeminate and, you know, and, and oh, the liberal modern culture, right? It's like, but no, I think one of the beautiful things about sort of the integral narrative is that people evolve towards greater and greater interpersonal awareness so that the increase in power actually leads me to appreciate the perspective of the mailman um, and not just want to dominate them, right? So I guess to put that all in terms of a question, what's the relationship of power to domination? And the last thing I'll throw into that is sort of the, the added, um, I'll own, right? That like, I don't think that... I wouldn't say that domination shouldn't play any part in the future of the universe or anything like that, right? Like there are areas of existence in which domination should be, I'd say, the thing that governs. And a lot of that does pertain to the animal kingdom, right? Like you can't watch a nature documentary and then feel bad when the gazelle gets eaten uh, because then the lion doesn't eat, right? And so that's the way that that works. But again, this is where I see that retro romantic fallacy of like saying, oh, well, if that's 
it, or and also the naturalistic fallacy. Well, if that's where we came from, if that's if the lion is powerful because it ate the gazelle, therefore we should be more like the lion. We should go beat up the mailman, right? That's a conflation that I don't want to make and I don't think needs to be made. So can you tease apart some of these things like power, domination, um, integration? Sure. And obviously we could throw the words around in different ways, right? You could say uh, like domination is a word like power. You could, well, if I could actually extend it to encompass everything, it would just have to have all these different shades, or I could use it to mean the negative as opposed to a positive. There's a real risk of this fetishization of degenerate versions of power. And I think that's nihilism, right? Nihilism is, um, in its most general form, processes that devalue the things that give us value. And in an ev evolutionary structural context, that means rolling you back toward more primitive versions. There are more primitive versions of the same thing, right? It's still a power process, but it's actually less powerful. Right? The people who are more powerful, you think of a great martial arts master or something like that. That's very different than a guy who's going to beat up the mailman. And it feels more potent, right? This guy can't get anything. He can't find any better power option than beating up the mailman. That's very low grade, right? So there's these processes which outburst from us in fascism, but are essentially nihilistic and lurking with us most of the time that can't get power in a complexity level and roll back to a simpler level. Right? And so that's problematic. We want to minimize the degree to which that happens. But none of that can allow us to um, not feel the risk and the obscenity of what the overall tree of power is like under all these conditions. Right? Nietzsche is asking himself to take a real risk. Right? And this is this is a clean, intellectual, well-behaved guy who comes out of a minister's house, right? And he's challenging himself to say, look, is there something that I like about Christ and Socrates and God that's also in Cesare Borgia, that's also in a snake eating a frog, that's also in everybody I don't like, right? What is the common element of all motive, high and low, because only if I understand that total Dionysian tree, will I be able to start making the meta valuation system, the revaluation of all the values means you have to put all the values on the same line, which means you have to see what they all have in common from Buddha to a rapist. What, what is that commonality? And you have to be able to emotionally, effectively allow yourself to go down all those pathways in order to do that. So if we don't allow ourselves that, if we won't take that risk, we can't find that universality. But when you find that universality in varying degrees, it is a graduated scale where there are these increased intensities where the goal of the universe is the enhancement of power. And so it wants to move and invent up those scales. It doesn't want to go backwards. Feels bad, feels demonic, feels nihilistic, feels fascistic, all those things, right? The One of the interesting things about separating the Dionysian swarm from the Sibylian mob is this clarity it brings to the way Nietzsche constantly denounces mythic German nationalism. It's nothing he dislikes more than German right. nationalism, yeah. right? And that's a mythic mob empowerment thing. But he's like, no, that's the exact opposite of what I'm talking about. What I'm really talking about is Stendhal or <laughs> whatever it is, right? And he's carefully trying to make this polarized teasing and show you the directionality, right? Even in his friend Wagner, who is a great genius, and he says, yes, this is a great genius. He put a lot of hope into this guy, but he wants to go, look, Here's Wagner and here's Bizet, right? Wherever you look, if you look closely enough, you can see a polarization that shows you the direction toward more integrated power or the direction away toward regressive disintegrated power in any context you examine. And I think that's one of the things we could really learn from him is to find that polarization, that value increase and in value regression within any topic, any idea, any word, any thinker. Yeah, uh, for me, this the reason why, all, and I agree with all that, I just, um, why this becomes so fraught, and I think why for me, the 
the the how do I want to put this? The reason why I find some of the articulation from the dark Renaissance to be uh, so problematic is because I feel like they're I interpret them as making this mistake of of saying that um, they're making the power equals domination conflation is is how I hear it. They're making the the and, and maybe I shouldn't personalize this so much, but I also want to be very explicit about why I feel like all this stuff matters so much, right? I feel like there are ways, right? Think about this, right? I mean, if you think about um, sort of what the the postmodern left is about, and you think about what the sort of uh, alt right and sort of right wing is about, I see this as sort of, um, you know, the postmodern left, and I mean like the, the kind of extreme elements of this, the kind of woke mob mentality, is doing this resentment sort of thing, and they're doing that priestly thing, and they're they're doing the you know um, identification with the victim mentality in order to gain power in the way that is just sort of a crude power play in a way that Nietzsche very brilliantly describes and accurately. On the other hand, the sort of alt right right wing si side of things is genuinely attracted to that red um, fascist kind of simplistic power equals domination. And we, and we want that. And, and in some ways they're both doing the same thing, right? This is why you can see some of the, the green, you know, being articulated in red forms is a lot of what the woke thing is about. They're both doing the same power is domination. Power is power over people. Um, and one of the beauties for me about like what the integral and metamodern models provides is an understanding that if you can frame these things developmentally, you can see that power does ride through the whole thing, but that it gets rarefied and, and complexified and, uh, and made, um, made beautiful and made sublime and transcendent, right? And I guess I just, in all of these things, I see the, the attraction of a regression to power as domination. Um, and I, I, I guess one of the ways to maybe frame this then is that like, well then is, as power becomes more complexified, what distinguishes it along that spectrum? Um, you know, what I, 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 I still feel like we need to get clear about what it is that we value, right? What are the values here? Um, and yes, there are ways that people who can talk in progressive, you know, a aspirational goals of wanting in a you know fair, more just society are just doing the same old red power play domination game for sure. And that is going to reify all those old problems. But I think there's also a way that there are people who are operating at a level of complexity that they can say, hey, no, like we do want power, but we want power properly applied. And that means not beating up the mailman. Um, I guess maybe to, to put that in a question is it's like, why do we not just say that not beating up the mailman is Christian piety? Right. What, what is it? What is the actual spiritual component there of its complexity that says, um, right. Because, because this is what I hear, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, if you were really powerful, like, yeah, you do, you'd act on these aggressive impulses. You would be the blonde beast. You would do all this stuff. Right. And it's like, well, no, you, you wouldn't. And it's, and the answer isn't because you're a moralist. The answer isn't because, oh, but I'm, I'm a Christian pious person and I pray and that's not the right thing to do. Like, that's not the answer. That's a very crude initial reaction to why you don't do that. But then it becomes complexified and rarefied and you understand more and more why that's not the thing you do. And yet again, there's sort of this pre-trans thing there. It's like, well, if you're not beating up the mailman, you're not powerful, are you? So can you explain a little bit like, why don't you beat up the mailman? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there might be situations in which your best move is to beat up the mailman. That's but true. Hopefully that's not the case, right? Yeah. What we want to do is set up a world ecosystem <laughs> where almost all of your empowerment options are better than that one. And there are people who are going to emphasize something that sounds to you to be regressive and they're going to do that for a variety of reasons maybe they are a little bit over invested in a retro romantic atavistic fetishization of domination okay maybe it's just a way of phrasing right 
you read Nietzsche on the blonde beast, you're like, holy shit. But then you're like, this is the same guy who's breaking down, weeping and trying to keep a horse from getting beaten on the street. This is a very nice, well-behaved human being who just likes to talk that way to put it in our face. And then there's the idea that there's a certain therapeutic value to emphasizing those things because we all tend to err on the side of not integrating them well enough. And we need to be able to broach our impulse to beat up the mailman or anyone else's impulse to beat up the mailman in order to understand where they're coming from and thread these different perspectives together on the same thread of that will to power. So there are a number of ways and reasons and meanings, just like Nietzsche talks about the, you know, what is the meaning of the ascetic idea? Well, it's different for an artist than it is for a priest, et cetera, et cetera, right? What is the meaning of a phrasing that indicates a seemingly exaggerated emphasis on regressive power dynamics? Depends on who's doing it. Many different meanings for many different groups. But overall, the intensification of the will to power is based on how well you can integrate different kinds of energies in yourself, right? I think he talks somewhere about if you become master of all these different unruly instincts and bring them together, you've entered into this the most fertile ground, right? You're a candidate for the great health. The peak experiences come out of many of your parts being embraced, coming together, overflowing into a, a kind of omnidirectional empowerment experience. And that empowerment spirits can be hypothetically quantified. This is one of the things he toys with in the Will to Power Notebooks is if you're able to see something that all values have in common, then how do you arrange the values relative to each other in terms of an intensity metric? What's more powerful feeling? And it's the most number of intense forces that you can bring together and harmonize into a single relational discharge that reinterprets the world. So the more elements of yourself, the more stages of yourself, the more types of human beings, the more aspects of reality you can bring together, the more intense the empowerment experience is. And then we can use that and adjudicate that and go, yeah, it's not that the person beating up the mailman is fundamentally doing something different than what the rest of us are, but we maybe should look down on that and try to prevent that. Uh, not only because it might destabilize the empowerment of the overall social system we've set up, but just also because that's a low-grade power. You don't want that guy stuck in low-grade power. You want to have people achieving more empowerment than that as a standard. Yeah, I, I, I'm mostly there with you. I, I, I feel like there is a, a qualitative difference, an emergence, really, actually, that occurs. Yeah, sure. You know, I think that. Um, at least I'd like to, right? These are the these are the areas I'm pursuing. So whether or not in 15 years, you know, I'll still hold to this is a different question, I guess. But I'm most attracted to the idea that yes, you can draw a a a a a, a, a single thread, you know, put it on a spectrum between you know me writing a concerto and someone beating up a mailman as both being acts of you know of of expressions of power. But I want to I want to say that that spectrum is the same sort of way that like, yeah, you could also say that I'm a bunch of atoms, right? But if you do that, then you're making a reductive move. You've sort of decreased the complexity so much that like you've missed something in the whole um, by reducing it to the parts. And uh, I want to say that something about power gets transfigured as it moves through the realm of complexity. Um, which again, this is sort of my whole point, right? Which is that I think the classic reductionist move, which is always destructive, it's always regressive, right? Is to is is to is to break things down into its parts, thinking it can maintain the essence of the whole in the parts. And sometimes you can do that, and sometimes you can't. You know, you can you can do that with elemental matter, but you can't do that with life and matter. You know, like there's something there's a there's a you know, an ultra quality that gets introduced in that emergence. And then you stack another emergence on that and another emergence. And to try to reduce something like culture to matter becomes so ridiculous and, and absurd that you wind up, that's nihilism, you know, a, a, that would be a reduction of value in the intense sense. So I want to say that, yes, we can draw a distinction in the same, in the sense that there is this sort of golden thread that ties it all together. 
but you know, a lion attacking a gazelle and my neighbor attacking the mailman and me writing a concerto, or let's just be fair and say me attacking the mailman, my neighbor uh, composing the concerto, right? There's a, there's a qualitative difference there. And, uh, and I, I want to maintain that meaningful distinction because I feel like when we begin to erase it is when you start actually inviting regression towards fascism and nihilism. That's how you take an ethical stand right now. It's, these are relative normativities as far as I'm concerned, right? You're looking at, if you were going to break something down to its more basic parts, that's relative to a particular wholeness. And that wholeness is part of something else or could be part of something else. Likewise, each of those parts could be broken down to their parts. So it depends where you're putting the framing. You go, look, this is the level of normative empowerment that I am ethically committed to. I think we should be at least at this level, aspirationally. And I'm going to try to defend that. And that's absolutely the right thing to do and is an expression of one's power. And and what are all the things we need to do in order to undergird that by making sure we're not sabotaging it from within by rejecting something and objective efforts in order to sustain that. But it doesn't mean we're doing something fundamentally different than someone who's setting that bar three stages lower. They're doing the same thing. For sure. From your point of view, they are the lesser and you must dominate them by imposing (laughs) your normative ethical frame. (laughs) Well, and and that's good because increases in the quantity are also increases in the quality, right? Beyond a certain number of degrees, the water becomes steam. There's been a qualitative shift because there was a quantitative shift, right? And you go, well, listen, I've got a steam engine that I'm trying to run as myself, as my relationships, as society, I don't want to regress to water. I'm going to call water unacceptable now. (laughs) Doesn't mean I don't understand it. Doesn't mean it isn't the same basic thing, but we're trying to get this steam engine going. So we are going to say, this is the cutoff and we're going to ethically defend that threshold. I, that's how I see it very much so. And the degree to which I don't feel like that is necessarily the terms of the discussion around some of the metamodern game B dark Renaissance stuff, at least as I understand the terms of the discussion, that's the thing I want to focus on. And I want to clarify too. Like I want to know, are my interlocutors like, do we, are we basically on the same page here? We're just using different language or are we actually saying different things? And that I shouldn't in this sense too, I don't want to single out the dark Renaissance. This happens the same with issues of indigeneity, right? People want to say, we need to go back to an ind- indigenous form of, of, uh, you know, uh, relating to the earth and whatnot. And it's like, well, yes. And, <laughs> you know, we also want to have antibiotics and we also want to have, um, you know, uh, awareness of cultural context and things that you wouldn't get, uh, you know, if, if we were just to, to do that. Right. And so a lot of these terms of the discussion get simplified and, and wind up sounding retro romantic or regressive in ways that it's sort of like, well, this is the whole point, right? This is sort of the whole insight, the beautiful, beautiful insight of an integral way of thinking about things is that we can bring into the future these things. We can bring in our impulses and our and our sense of domination. And that was the other thing I wanted to say too, right? Like, yes, that's a great example of like, if you live in a society that values, um, let's say, individual uh, autonomy or, um, you know, like the fact that, that the mailman has rights, you know, like if I went and beat him up, like that would be that would be against the law. And the fact that we've done that means that that way of thinking about things dominates over people who would otherwise just be hoarding, you know, going out in hordes with bats and beating up mailmen all over the place. Um, and so like, the, then, then you can start to really appreciate the importance of domination, but it's domination for the sake of, right? Not just Oh, isn't it? How, how great is it that we get to dominate these hordes of mailmen, you know, attackers, right? It's like domination for an end that, that I can, you know, 
that's the point, I guess, is that it starts becoming something beyond just domination for its own sake. There start becoming other things. And I, I don't want to start sounding idealistic in the kind of classical sense, right? Or like uh, transcendental, like, oh, now it's about idea. And so now domination is all you know justified. No, it's like, it's, it's more than that. But um, anyway, I don't know. Is there anything at this point in this conversation you feel like it needs to be thrown into the mix? Well, here? I think there's, um, there's work to be done in terms of the ethical clarification of these things, right? We can see in Nietzsche that he's making ethical stance and they can go in a couple of different directions, right? One is the ethical stand evidenced by his behavior and how he thinks a person should act in the world. Another one is the ethical stand in terms of how he thinks people should explore and investigate and dare and risk themselves in the world. Those are both important, but trying to clarify for yourself what is the ethical extension of these ideas is something that he doesn't do for us. We've got to do that for ourselves moving forward. And it's a very interesting set of questions, right? If we embrace this, um, that value is related to the will to power, that we need a more Dionysian society, that we have to come back and down and stop the premature ascending and fully descend in, before we ascend, what do the ethics of that world look like, right? What do we do for each other? What do we tell each other? Well, there's a great book, Julian Young's book, Nietzsche and Religion, which explores him as a communitarian religious philosopher. It's a very interesting book. He touches on a lot of themes where you might assume that Nietzsche is promoting the you know, individual power seeker against the herd, but Julian Young thinks it's very much the opposite, that the, the advanced individuals are, are the way of making the folk community function, that Nietzsche never lost the communitarian mythological project of Birth of Tragedy. Uh, one of the places you see this is in the way he talks about noble relationship between peers, which we might just call being an adequate team member, right? On it, when you're playing soccer, sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow. You have to be capable of both. You honor each other. You honor other people scoring. You honor the other team, even though you're trying to defeat them. There's this recognition, um, respect for the other as a source of power, right? And that there's if you fight them, you want to fight them with honor. You don't want to take advantage of them for no reason. Although in a plane crash, you might have to eat them. All right. There's all these complicated, obvious things about what it's like to improve your power by honoring the power of the other and honoring the power of the collaboration, right? There's no sense in which the ethics of how to do that are in any way opposed to the ontological philosophy of the power drive as the fundamental nature of reality. Yes, I would definitely agree with that. And I think it's important too, because it's that very distinction that I, and I, I, I came to this conclusion pretty quickly after reading Nietzsche uh, was sort of like, um, because it, there's a certain way you could read him. And maybe this is for the, the readers that, you know, he's trying to throw off this, the, the scent or something, but uh, doing so dangerously, because you could read Nietzsche and be like, oh, you know, I'm just going to be totally uncompassionate and unpitiful. And anytime I see a person who like is, you know, you know, uh, panhandling or something like that, I'm just going to shout and scorn them. And, you know, and that'll make me feel empowered. Right. Um, and there's a certain, like you could, you know, you could use a certain kind of uh, chapter verse uh, citation that could back that up, but you could also say, what does a powerful person do? A powerful person has resources. They have the, the ability for magnanimity. They have the ability to, they are so powerful, they can give, they can see a person in need and say, hey, you know, here, let me help you out. Um, those are two responses that you could take from the same idea about valorizing power and the will to power. And I view the one, and I've actually, I mean, I've, I've, I've lived some of this so I can speak to experience. I view the approach of sort of scorning the, 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 the person begging for something as being pitiful, or no, I shouldn't say pitiful because that's going to be confusing, as being petty and being unpowerful. It's beating up the mailman. You know, it's like, oh, that's the best you can do. Whereas if you're able to, from your largesse of power, help people, be nice to people, be charitable, that is, that's an expression of power to me. And I feel there's sometimes, and unfortunately too often a conflation with that and the sort of Christian moralism and compassion and pity that, that, that Nietzsche demonizes um, in other places. And um, so in that sense, I would, I would, that's how I kind of tend to frame these things. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I if you yeah, want, I think that's absolutely. I mean, there's it comes down again to how you're doing it rather than what you're doing, right? And I encourage people to read and reread Genealogy of Morals. The essays in there are so dense and so beautiful, and particularly this thing about the ascetic ideal. What does it mean, right? Is it in whom and when is it a sign of someone sabotaging their ability to integrate their instincts into power moves because of some received perverse value assumption? Mm. And when is it actually a means of clarifying and organizing and taking their empowerment to the next level? And it varies for different kinds of characters under different kinds of circumstances. Generally speaking, we would assume, like, what would it take for me to attack the mailman? Well, it might happen if I was really distressed or had Alzheimer's or had some kind of breakdown of my overall functioning. It would be a sign of a decrease of power. I would be in a decadent condition. And so we need to, and when we see the way Nietzsche talks a lot about the amount of power it takes to not react, right? And he's, even though you can read in the Antichrist, he's throwing up an image of Christ and he's attacking uh, right. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the meaning of attack in Nietzsche? Because he explains very clearly that attack is a form of honor and attempt to clarify your own character. But he's very pro Christ, pro, right? That he grew up with this image and that there's a character who impressed history and was able to, for whatever perverse reason, potentially feel a sense of power beyond the need to retaliate, beyond the resentment, beyond blame. That's a very interesting option. And people could follow that idealistically and go astray. They could be taught to do that in ways that sabotage their awareness of their own authentic complexity and real reactions. But it's also a way that some people can gain an even higher level of power. Because to reactively respond to a stimulus uh, is a sign of weakness in Nietzsche's mind, right? And he knows this through having been deeply sick. When he has no resources, he can't help but react. And when he has power again, he doesn't have to worry about every, he doesn't have to attack the mailman for the, because there's some reason, right? I hate the fucking mailman. He did this, right? You don't have enough power to go beyond that or have a better strategy. So there's a sense in which reactivity, which we see in a lot of right and left regression to amber and red, which is this weird tribal reactivity that indicates that they're essentially weak and craving some kind of quick burst of empowerment, just like you might want a quick burst of sugar, but it's not nutritious. It's not really going to give you the great health. And I mean, I, I think there's a fascinating thing at the end of Zarathustra, right? Where he comes, he holds a party for the higher men. Right. And these are, are the higher men. They are the great human beings of history in a way, right? The really the people we would say are these are the Martin Luther Kings and the Buddha is there, right? These are the higher men. And he says, look, we, you're not the ultra human. <laughs> you're not there yet. And he goes out, he talks to his animals, he comes back in and they're having the ass festival. They put a donkey up on the table, they're drunk, they're laughing. And he says, this is the best we're going to get right now. The higher men who are the kinds of people we used to still call the higher men combined with this humor and this anarchy and this revelry. If we can get that together, we at least have a decent initial approximation of the path toward the ultra human. You're nowhere close yet, but this is the best we can do at the moment. This is where we would start the actual virtues of higher spiritually developed human beings with revelry and indulgence and collaborative immersion and psychoanalysis and art and embracing all of these things get that together somehow that's at least a starting point well said um yeah well this is this has been great i mean um i've been this has been very helpful and i've really enjoyed being able to you know pull apart some of these ideas and um start you know, anytime I feel like uh, I've been working with sort of a binary and then it can kind of explode into a, a couple, it's like more of a gradient or something. I'm always appreciative of that sort of an increase of dimensionality often happens after speaking with you. Um, but yeah, any, uh, any other additional thoughts you wanted to throw in? I, I, have you enjoyed the uh, trajectory this conversation has taken or uh, has it been a bit? No, this has been great. These are um, 
fantastic themes I don't get to talk about nearly enough. Um, I, you know, my Nietzsche, my fantasy of Nietzsche is very much um, a, a prophetic spiritual exemplar of metamodern spirituality and an integralism that does not avoid the tragic. And uh, I guess all I would say in conclusion is fucked Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> you can throw that on some merch too, I suppose. Um, all right. Well, hey, stick around. Um, but I'll finish this off for now. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And I'll, uh, we should talk again soon. Absolutely. Love it, Brennan. <laughs>